on to the, some of the guys that uh, we were think have a little bit more neutral landing spots. And one guy that was uh, some people considered to be the top running back, top prospect in this class, Trey Benson lands in the early third round with the Cardinals. And it's not a great landing spot just because he is guaranteed to be behind James Conner. So it's going to be tough for him to come by work. And we've talked about how we like James Conner, just like as one of those underrated guys who consistently produces and kind of can kind of do everything. There's no like glaring flaw to his game. He's no like, game breaker game changer guy but he does everything well he can catch the ball so it's kind of a tough landing spot for Trey Benson in that sense that he's got a guy behind or in front of him who doesn't have a super exploitable flaw but it's not necessarily a flaw but uh James Conner we we've talked about a little bit he he consistently misses time the the note Mm -hmm. you put in here missed at least four games in six out of his seven seasons in the league so he he's a shoe in to miss a handful of games every single season and you never really know if that how I mean it's it's impossible to predict injuries especially like these minor injuries that only keep them out for a couple of games it's pr- it's tough to predict if and when those are going to happen but if, if Trey Benson is given that opportunity I mean he's the type of player that could at a minimum if he's given the opportunity like maintain a role even when Connor comes back I don't want to say he would like completely overtake Connor as the top running back in um in Arizona but I think if he's given the chance and uh, he'll, he'll be able to maintain a consistent role and like produce a split backfield. And I think he could do that even without a Connor injury. Like I, I liked him as a prospect. Uh, I was going back and forth for a little while, ultimately settled on thinking that Brooks was the top talent out of this draft class. Um, and uh, Benson as the second running back, but so pe- people regarded him to be a quality prospect. I mean, like I know this is a bad running back class and he ended up with third round draft capital, but I still think there's a world where he carves out a role regardless of a Connor injury. So I don't think it's like a completely like dust. Like we're not going to consider Trey Benson as a fantasy asset, um, but it, it's not great. Like he, he's clearly going to be the second guy. And unless something significant happens to Connor, I don't think we're going to be seeing a high volume or high workload for Trey Benson in his rookie season. Is that about where you're at with Benson? Yeah, it is definitely a handcuff in my opinion, but as you mentioned, a handcuff that's likely to see some starting work. And depending on when that happens, I mean, we're talking about a guy in Trey Benson that is 220 pounds and ran a 439. I mean, that's like Brees Hall, Jonathan Taylor. Very few guys have that type of size and can move that fast. So would it shock me at all? Should he start and then just be too good to give it back over? I don't know. I wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, he fell to round three, so he's certainly not this type of generational prospect like those guys were drafted far earlier, but he's got the build. He's got that three down skill set, pretty solid pass catcher. I think a little untapped parts of his game there. And we know how involved they like to get their running backs there in Arizona. The passing games, why James Conner has been such a useful fantasy asset these last few years. So whether that's because he just flashes and is so good, they can't keep him off the field and he just overtakes Conner probably unlikely but it's in the realm of possibility but certainly if and when Connor does unfortunately have that injury imp come and nip him like it always does I could see him taking that ball opportunity and just going uh to the point where they can't turn turn it back and give it to him and certainly for the longer term outlook again this isn't a dynasty show we're focused just on 2024 today we'll talk about dynasty on another podcast but ultimately I do love this spot long term for Benson. I think it's on the last year here of James Conner deal, if not, you know, only two more years there. And he could absolutely be that three down back of the future, learning from a true veteran like Conner, a workman, the, the right guy to raise him up. Uh, I'm a big fan of Benson long term. It's more so not a huge diehard of this 2024 outlook. Uh, but a guy that's in a similar spot, in my opinion, is Jalen Wright. Going to the Dolphins, another crowded kind of mess of a situation where you have Raheem Mostert, Devon Achan, but then you also look at how damn productive this backfield is, whoever it is getting the opportunity. So if, if we've seen Mostert and Achan both struggle with injuries, I know Achan's only one year in, but smaller build, uh, and Mostert now at age 33, and he, he lasted all last year, uh, but man, I'd be stunned if that continues this year there could be a path where Jalen Wright becomes a lead back at some point for the Dolphins. And we saw 40-point you know, days from Devon H.N. last year. There's also the, the floor of 
Jalen Wright doesn't even sniff the field at all this year, given that he's got two pretty solid backs in front of him that have produced at really high levels. But if he does get on the field, I'm a huge fan of the game. Again, sub 4'4 four, four speed at 215 pounds, a quality receiver. And Mike McDaniels, like I talked about with Kyle Shanahan, whenever he drafts, especially running backs, he was the 49ers run game coordinator. Uh, this is a guy that really knows his type, and we've seen his type flourish whenever they get the chance. So all it's going to take is either an injury or right to just flash in camp. And I like the player a lot, so I wouldn't be shocked at all if he does. And we had a quote from uh, Mike McDaniel there where he said, I think all the players benefit when we have this many running backs with talent because there's supreme urgency to do right with the ball if you deserve to have it. So he's uh, that kind of quote tells you that it's not like, nope, Devon Achan's our lead guy and Raheem Mostert's the second up and maybe right will get sprinkled in. It's like if, if Wright's going to be the best guy, he'll get the looks. That's, again, two big mountains to climb ahead of those guys. But whether it's injury or Wright just flashes, this is a backfield that can yield humongous value. And so just because it's crowded right now, I don't want to just cross off Jalen Wright. And that's why he's not a, a loser in my draft landing spot grades because of how good it could be if he gets that chance. It's just a bit murky for how he'll get there. Yeah, I, I don't like – I feel like it's almost a guarantee that at some point in the season, either Achan or Mostert will get a little dinged up. And I don't think Wright like will come into a starting role, but at a minimum get some touches. And I think this is just like a total mess of the backfield. Like in terms of like the player and the offensive fit, it's great. Like, uh, like everyone would be excited for Jalen Wright heading to the, the Dolphins just in terms of his skill set and what Mike McDaniel can do. But this is like a total nightmare of a backfield. Like, this is the type of thing that it makes me want to, like, procrastinate having a take on it. Like, it's just like you can see it going, like, so many different ways. And the, the quotes from Mike McDaniel don't really help in terms of, like, trying to figure out what this depth chart and the opportunities are going to look like. So this is one of those ones that's just going to be highly debated throughout the offseason. In my opinion, I think this hurts the my how I value Devon Achan the most out of all, simply because his price is just going to be so significantly higher. And I, I've like stood by this throughout the offseason. I am, and I don't think anyone would like bark at it. I, I don't think that he is a workhorse back. Like he's not going to be taking on a ton of touches every single week. And eh, we, we we can debate this throughout the offseason, but. I, I, I don't I think the landing spot is solid, but it, it's just going to be a mess. It could be messy indeed, but the upside is high. That's why you can't call it a complete loser uh, of a spot. Uh, and then the last guy we had in like that neutral category, I didn't even put his name on the tag here, but Bucky Irving obviously athletically was so underwhelming at the combine, but then you put the tape on and you see the skill set. Great, great pass catcher. I said Dylan Labe had the upside to be the best pass catcher of this class, but I definitely think it will be Bucky Irving. Uh, he's got that really, really unique quickness, and and he plays so much faster uh, than than the time forty might suggest. And and you look at his actual miles per hour when clocked on the, the season, he was the fourth highest back of this class. So I'm not overly worried about the bad testing. I get that Rashad White. 336 touches, like we talked about already. He was an absolute monster from volume perspective, but they've talked all year about how they wanted to lessen that role. And at minimum, I could see Bucky Irving coming in and eating a ton of receiving work to lessen that load for Rashad White, which makes me a bit concerned. We're going to talk about veteran winners and losers on another show as well, uh, but I am a little concerned with Rashad White seeing that type of workload, I, I think is a definite no in 2024 and I could see Bucky Irving really doing some damage as a receiver plus if something does happen to White he's got that three down skill set so uh, the kind of classic handcuff with benefits I think there's a clear role from day one and I could see him evolving into a featured back if anything does happen to Rashad White so I call this a nice neutral situation here for Bucky Irving yeah I'm I'm not as concerned about like how the situation looks for um for Bucky Irving, I'm going to be a lot more nervous about uh, Rashad White than I think other people are going to be. I mean, I don't – Rashad White didn't he, – he did everything for the Bucks last year. He was out there for all three downs, and he was catching passes. He was taking all the carries. And I think this was simply a function of them just not having anyone better to do anything else. I don't think it's that Rashad White is like an insanely good running back who deserves to have 330 touches in a season and like should be out there for every single snap. I just don't think that they had a better option and they were comfortable giving Rashad White. And 
So when his volume gets reined back in a little bit, he's going to have to get there on efficiency or touchdowns. And that makes me pretty nervous. Like he's not the type of talent that I want to be betting on when his volume gets pulled back in. So we'll, we'll, I, I don't, it's too early to say like how steep his price is going to fall. I anticipate it to come down some, but if it doesn't come down enough, I'm going to be pretty nervous about Rashad white. And I can see myself being off of Rashad white throughout the summer, but like I said, it's gonna it's gonna take some a couple of weeks for this ADP to like fully like flesh itself out and see where everyone's really landing. So we'll we'll, we'll revisit this like in, in a couple of shows perhaps and see where Rashad White's being taken. But I, I that it, it's not uh, I'm nervous about the pick that I'm not like super bullish on Bucky Irving. Like I like him. I I enjoy the three down skill set. That's something that I always value in running backs. But uh, I, it's more that I'm becoming more and more nervous about Rashad White. What is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below. Ooh.